Hey y'all, happy Sunday. Welcome to the start of another weekly reading vlog. Already, I am behind. It is June 9th and I have read one book, finished one book. Really need to be doubling down on my TBR, especially because it is so ambitious for Pride Month. I always wanna read as many queer books as I possibly can. I'm failing, clearly. Even though I want this to be a very successful reading week, I'm already failing at that because I've spent way too long just scrolling through Instagram on my phone. For my weekly reading vlog, I do need to try and get read my TBR jar picks, which this month for my digital TBR, specifically for royalty, I'm gonna be going with In the Ravenous Dark by A.M. Strickland, which if I'm being honest, I don't really remember what this is about. I think one of the main characters is pansexual and there might be some ace rep in it. The little tagline is power never dies and neither does desire, oh my. And then for my physical read for a gifted book, yeah, a gifted book, I need to do The Gunkel. This one was also annotated for me by my friend Kat, so that means it's gonna be a very fun reading experience and I'm gonna be buddy reading this with Destiny. Across the board, I will definitely be enjoying this book, I just know it, yet I'm currently in the middle of another very, ambitious pick. So I don't know when this will happen if I'm being honest. I am a member of Jane Agaton's Patreon and every month we have a little readathon for a weekend or like 24 hour 48, something like that. And this month it was to focus on like your 2024 TBR and the only book that fit that plus was queer is A Strange and Stubborn Endurance by Foz Meadows, which ironically was Destiny's pick for me on my 12 recs. I have not gotten nearly enough of this red as I wanted. I'm currently at 62 pages and I am liking it though I mean, if you need trigger warnings please check them out because there's something very graphic and traumatic that happens on page in the second chapter right out of the get-go was like oh shit okay this is this is gonna be a little rough but I'm already really liking the character work that's being done because of that traumatic event and seeing how it's impacted the character and how their circumstances don't really allow for a lot of time to heal. This is set in a fantastical world and our main character is like the son of a lord. He has recently been promised to marry a person from a neighboring country, though his father initially was expecting him to be marrying the daughter. When the main character's preference for men is revealed to his father um, in an unfortunate way, his father assumes that, you know, this is just gonna implode and it's all gonna blow up in his face. Rather, this opposite country is much more open-minded when it comes to relationships and gender as well. We've seen that there's a character who is non-binary and they end up working out that this betrothal wasn't guaranteed to the princess, let's say, rather just to one of the scions. Works out that they end up changing it so that the main character, Val, will end up betrothed to the prince character. I don't think he's actually a prince. I am still getting a hold on the terminology for this world. Kathari? I think is his name. But so obviously it is a arranged marriage situation, but then I do know that it has like a political mystery going on as well. I am liking it so far from what I've read. I just haven't really had a lot of time to sit down and read. I was hoping I would get more read yesterday when Josh and I went to his parents' place. First off, it's a long drive out there. And then second, like we were all just kind of hanging out in their big backyard. I didn't, unfortunately, I was social, darn me. Then I'm also continuing on the Extraordinary series with Flashfire by TJ Klune. This is probably gonna be more like my audiobook for right now, even though I do have the physical as well, about 80 pages in. Initially planning to read this as my last book for Galactathon in May, but unfortunately that didn't work out. I did want to continue the series. I wanted to ride this wave. Nick is still a certified gay mess and I adore him. This book starts on like the cringiest and most hilarious of circumstance. I, oh my God, I just, I love it. And then the relationship between Nick and his boyfriend Seth is precious and sweet and wonderful and like all of the ways of young love. And then there's the superhero situation that is also involved. Nick is still kind of obsessed with extraordinaries, but he wants to do everything he can to help people. And I do like that. There's also been some questioning as to just the role of the police in this world, very reminiscent to real world issues. And that Nick's father is a detective and now he specifically works for a section of the police department that specializes in extraordinary crimes. Though he previously has been punished for for abusing a suspect. And then one of Nick's best friends, Gibby, is a black woman. So there has been a little bit of discussion around like police brutality and racial profiling, as well as Nick 
finally starting to realize like his own biases towards the police because of his father's role as a police officer, how that has allowed him to put his blinders on in certain situations. And I do like that. It kind of ties back into ongoing theme from the first book of things aren't always black and white. And Nick is finally starting to figure out some of the gray that exists in the world and how a lot of these situations that Nick himself has never had to think on are still important and like the nuance that is necessary to consider them. And I think all of that stuff is being well handled in a way where you can broach those topics for a young adult audience, which is what the story is geared towards. Um, plans for the rest of the day. I need to do a few little cleaning things around the house. I need to clean up the bathroom. Oh shoot, I need to put a load of Josh's laundry and the washer because I told him I would do that. Tonight I'm going to be watching my niece and nephew because it's my brother and sister-in-law's anniversary so that'll be fun and then I do have a goal for myself this week that I am going to get back on top of getting up early and taking faith for I, I can't say the word because she's laying right here. We are officially topping 90 degrees every single day and it is too damn hot to take her on one of those after work meaning I got to do it in the morning when it's still cool out but I like sleep and I am not a morning person, so getting that routine is the hardest part for me. But that is my goal that I'm gonna try and do this week and then doing so will also allow me more audiobook reading time. Hello. Happy Monday. It, I keep getting thrown off about the fact that it's Monday because I went to my brother's tonight, seeing as how on Thursday, when I usually go to my brother's, I have my book club meeting. And it's just, it's really weirding me out that it's only Monday. <laughs> Hi, I hope you had a good one. Um, seeing as how it's kind of late and I just got out of the shower waiting for Josh to get home. Figured I'd talk to y'all while I do my skincare and all. Um, I had a pretty good day at work. I've been doing a lot of scanning. It's more low key day for me. I have actually gotten a fair amount read today. I did get up and take Faith on a walk. Yay me. Very glad. I really need to get in that habit, as I mentioned yesterday. And while I was walking her, I continued listening to the audiobook of Flashfire by TJ Klune, the second book in the Extraordinary series. I also read some more of it uh, when I was driving to and from my brother's house, plus a little bit whenever I got home and was like putting out the trash and stuff. I am continuing to really enjoy this. I really like that both books so far kind of follow the same plot of a lot of superhero stories, but like through the eyes of the person that's not the main hero. I, I actually really like that twist on the story, but at the same time, it is so campy. It is so peak cringe humor, oh my God. I love Nick, the main character so much, but he makes me so uncomfortable. And ironically, since I've been watching Schitt's Creek with my brother and sister-in-law, I think that's like kind of the perfect same sort of humor I can equate it to, is where like, you are suffering from secondhand embarrassment, but the the character themselves isn't necessarily really embarrassed by what they're doing. As I mentioned yesterday, there are some heavier topics around like police brutality that's been brought up, but also the issues that unfortunately queer people still have to face in their everyday life. And and obviously, being a giant nerd, I can't help equating it to like, let's say the X-Men, which was literally just a giant allegory for, you know, racism. And also can look at as a metaphor for homophobia because there's a lot of stuff in this story, particularly like as the plot is growing now, that I definitely am drawing parallels to many Marvel stories, namely, I would say Spider-Man and also X-Men. We have a big bad that's emerging, who's kind of like our Lex Luthor character, our Norman Osborn, our, our Robert Kelly. But at the same time, like we really don't know what his end game is. And I'm so intrigued. We have met a few other extraordinaries now. I really like them. One of them is a drag queen. So yeah, I'm really enjoying this. And once again, it's just reinforcing the fact that like TJ Klune is aware of what he's writing. It, it's campy, it's cheesy, very similar to many other superhero stories, but with some queer happiness also at the forefront. I really enjoy seeing Nick with his boyfriend, with his friends, and just living their best life as teenagers also. Like they're getting very excited for prom, yet they're also having to worry about all the superhero stuff. It's 
it's great i love it i did get a little bit further into a strange and stubborn endurance as well i read some last night and then today on my lunch break i, I realized this is broken down into parts and the parts are where we have flips in perspective so we started with velison and then we have switched to kai i'm still not sure if i should pronounce this c is a c or the c is like an s um i do like him though it seems as far as character issues are going he doesn't really have anything going on apart from just the fact that now he is in an arranged marriage whereas velison definitely is having to deal with some crap i'll just put it that way without getting into too many spoilers but now that they've started to actually interact i'm even more on board because they've agreed to try and be friends but almost immediately they have this banter going on where the theme of it is kind of picking at the differences in their two cultures playfully mocking each other for that but then inevitably something will remind them of the seriousness in their situation not always rainbows and butterflies but i also really like that pretty pretty quickly at least the trauma that val is kind of carrying around with him gets acknowledged and talked about with kai because i was worried it was going to be this like ongoing secret thing in a way almost too similar to like that of winter's orbit but no it actually gets brought out in the open really quickly which i'm not sure if that's a bad thing or a good thing in regard to pacing however we have found a little bit more about the plot in that there's a mystery somebody keeps trying to kill val put a stop to the union between these two countries every time they've done something they say they're doing it in Kai's name, in like his moniker, but obviously he is not responsible for that. We've seen through his eyes and he is just as shocked and angered by this as Val and the other people in his clan, that's the term. So there's definitely gonna be some political intrigue and mystery going on alongside the romance. And I'm excited to see how that develops, honestly, because thus far I am digging this. It really feels like a fantastical regency romance thus far and i'm into it i'm into it uh that's it for now i am gonna go ahead and finish getting ready for bed josh just got home so perfect timing Hello my friends, it is Tuesday night and I hope you had a good day because I certainly did. So work was nice and relaxed thankfully, probably shouldn't say that too loud honestly, but I got a lot more scanning done which was really low key thankfully. And then on top of that, seeing as how I was doing mostly scanning and half the day went by with no phone calls, I was able to finish listening to Flash Fire by TJ Klune, which I had made a good dent in this morning when I took Faith on a walk, but I did go ahead and finish this one out and it was really good. I did really like this. I think Klune is doing a really great job of like balancing the silly, fun, cringy elements of this series with the more serious aspects and I'm really enjoying that. I'm very intrigued to see where things are gonna go with the last book, but I just love seeing Nick and his friends doing good, having a good time whilst doing that. It's so sweet. Nick's relationship with his dad also just feels very, very well handled in that it's so realistic. The moments where you really love your parent and then there are moments where they think they know what's best for you and you disagree. I won't go into any more specifics there for spoilers, but oh God, like there were some very heart-wrenching scenes when it came to Nick and his dad in this book. I really, really like that. Basically those last three hours of the audiobook just kept me company and I had a great time with it. So I did finish this one out on audio, meaning tomorrow morning I will start into The Ravenous Dark by A.M. Strickland, which is my digital pick for the month. I also got some more reading done in A Strange and Stubborn Endurance by Foz Meadows, and I'm continuing to really enjoy this. We've flipped back to Velison's perspective. God, there's already been some like heart-wrenching scenes that have been going on. I appreciate the fact that the relationship between these two boys is just 
them trying to make the best of their situation, them poking fun at the fact that they're husbands and yet don't really know each other that well, don't, don't know that much about the other's culture. <laughs> I do have a few annotations going on. I really like the uh, discussions around Velison's trauma thus far and kind of shifts that we're already beginning to see in his character. And then the little moments between Vel and Kay, the small things of them trying to already make this relationship work. And then Vel's relationship with Markle is my third annotation. Markle's his valet and is mute. They are so cute. You can tell they care so much about each other and just are best friends. On top of taking Faith on a walk this morning, Josh and I also went to the nature preserve and did another mile and a half. So I walked three miles today. We watched some more of Sword Art Online, which I am not loving, but we're gonna jump forward. Gun Girl Online, that one. So we're gonna jump forward to that one because Josh thinks I'll like it more. I, I have feelings about Sword Art. If anyone wants to um, ask about them, leave me comments and I'll share. I think now Josh is gonna do some video games. I am going to continue reading this because I'm really liking it and I am nowhere near far enough through. Hey y'all, happy Wednesday. Hope you had a good day. I once again got out of bed, took Faith on a walk. We're doing good. We're staying on top of it. And I did officially start into In the Ravenous Dark by Am Strickland. I am already liking this. The magic system is very funky. There are blood mages in this world where, you know, their magic is based in blood. But the specific country our main character lives in is fearful that blood mages will become too powerful. So they partner them with spirits of the dead who then control the blood mages. Our main character's father is an insanely powerful blood mage from a separate country though, where the guardianship isn't really normal. Um, but unfortunately at the beginning of the book, we kind of see in the past when he is finally discovered. Then after the prologue, we jump to our main character who is now like 19, 18, 19, something like that. And though she does have powers, she has kind of learned to hide them, but she also is, is that, that life? She, she's living a bit of a party girl life. She is constantly drowning her sorrows in partners and wine. However, unfortunately, after a night of debauchery, one of her partners ends up nearly injured and she is forced to save this person using her powers. So she is discovered, she is taken to the kingdom and revealed as this man's daughter, uh, who, you know, is insanely powerful because he has a very long line of family members who are blood mages, and it's definitely kind of based on like your ancestry. Our main character is pansexual, as we've seen. She mentions having had partners who are female, male, and non-binary, which is very cool. We just recently met a non-binary character. So I am liking this. The magic system is very cool. Roven herself thus far feels feels pretty true to the character that's been established what with like things she's experienced in her life it kind of makes sense that she's been maybe not taking the healthiest healthiest choices at the start and then it also makes sense why she is so fearful of the guardians why she's so distrusting of all of the royals and then also why she is uh, you know what? No, I can't even say that because spoilers. She definitely has a bit of an attitude, but she is also determined to try and figure out a way to get herself freed from her guardian and out from under the, the royals to make it so that she is not forced to use her powers for these people who she does not trust and do not care about her. She she and her mother have always been a part of the lower class, so she really there, there is no love loss between her and the royals and now being forced to work for them. Just, just making the situation worse. Like I said, I did get up and take Faith on a walk today. Yay, we were staying on top of that goal. I was not feeling motivated for work if I am being completely honest, but you know, work's work, gotta be an adult. Just, just had to power through the day. <laughs> and because I did that, I treated myself when I got home and allowed myself to sit down and read some more of Strange and Stubborn Endurance because I am continuing to really like this. I'm put 
I've surpassed 200 pages now. I'm at chapter 18. Once again, we are back in Kai's perspective. I like, again, that we're starting to see these two just try and build a friendship. They're just trying to get to know one another. But we're also seeing more and more about the politics that are taking place in Tithinian? Tithina. Tithina? I'm gonna go with Tithina. We're seeing more of the politics that are taking place in Tithina as Velison gets more settled there and meets more of the players involved. So there's the Tyrion, who is Kai's father, but then also there's the Yasa, who is Kai's grandmother. And so they are basically heads of two separate clans, but obviously Yasa's daughter married the Tyrion. And because the Tyrion's children are tied to both of these very powerful clans, there's just like a lot of moving parts that are involved when it comes to naming a successor for both the Tyrion and the Yasa. I did really like the Yasa. A player, she is definitely working the game. She knows how to make people do what she wants and I really admire that. But also her first interaction with Velison is so fun because she like wants to bring him up to date on everything that's going on with this while also kind of pumping him for information about his own situation with Kai and th these people trying to kill him. I will admit in regard to pacing, it's a little wonky because like the last 100 pages have literally been a single day maybe more like the last 150 pages have been a single day passing it feels like so much has happened in this book which i mean it has i'm 200 pages in but there is still so much to go this makes me feel as though we probably have barely scratched the surface of this investigation and then i remember the fact that literally a day has passed so yeah no we really have not explored much of the investigation and there's a second book which i am very intrigued by like what ha and on that note i'm gonna stop because i want to get in some more reading before josh gets home and before i inevitably pass out <laughs> Hey y'all, happy Saturday. Um, so I just didn't think to update last night, honestly. I had a pretty decent day at work. Josh and I went out to dinner at one of our favorite restaurants. That was delicious. We did a little bit of grocery shopping, then came back. I read a ton while Josh played some video games. It's going so well that today, Josh and I were a little lazy this morning. Once we finally got out of bed, I continued reading some of it. Then we dropped his car off to get an oil change, went over to his parents to have like a Father's Day lunch, took this with me. Anytime I wasn't talking with people, I continued reading. Again, I'm continuing to love this. 60-ish pages left at this point. Yes, I know. I have failed when it comes to like reading the owned book for my TBR jar, but I'm not gonna complain too much because technically this could also count as a gifted book and I am going to still try and read the Gunkle this month. I will say one thing that is throwing me, most of this plot has taken place across like four days. We have the start where Velison finds out he is going to be marrying uh, Kathari and then there's like, let's estimate a week of travel time for him to arrive in the other country. Once he gets there, it is just balls to the wall. Let's go, go, go. Like this has been so fast paced. And even at times where like it is slower, they're doing investigating. They're just like 
talking with people. Even then, I strangely feel like it's fast paced because I'm just so glued into the story. The characters are very well created, I, I gotta say. I did notice that I don't think I mentioned previously, Velicen's chapters are from first perspective, whereas Cathari's chapters are from third perspective. And I did think that was interesting. I am going to say again that Cathari's chapters do feel like they don't have anything nearly as deep or personal in comparison to like Velison struggling with this recent trauma. But even so, I do still like Kay. I, I feel like we've gotten to know him very well. Both of these men have really great personalities. I, I feel like every action they take within the story just reinforces the character that Meadows has created and the dynamics that's developed between them. I've mentioned, I really like that they initially are just are just saying let's let's become friends but as the days continue and especially given the situation they're in the middle of with somebody trying to kill vel or you know harm the royal family they become more reliant on each other because of that they have to trust one another and first off i love situations like that i mean i i love when it's like enemies who end up having to rely on each other these two aren't necessarily enemies they're husbands, but they don't really know each other that well whenever they like establish the trust there. There's just so many little moments to showcase that they're trying so hard to make this work, to make this friendship work. It's not surprising that eventually their care for the other person does, turn, does start to turn into less platonic feelings. I'm really, I am really sold on it. I wouldn't say by this point I'm convinced that they're in love with each other, but I'm definitely convinced that like there is something there. This could eventually become a romantic relationship and they they can grow to love one another. I, I would be totally convinced by that. There was a spicy scene, did enjoy. That was well handled. Again, the timeline messes with the perception of things because Vel went through this really traumatic thing not that long ago. And while yes, there's been these small moments where we can see he is growing and slowly healing from that. Again, like not that much time has passed. That was a pretty rough thing for him to already feel so comfortable. It was a little shocking that like nothing popped up in that moment to show that he was triggered in some way, shape or form because of what he's experienced. This is going fantastically. I'm really liking this so much so that I, uh, I picked up All the Hidden Paths, the second book in the series, when I ran by the library Thursday night. In like the last 200-ish pages that I've read and all of that that I've annotated, I've made the decision that I'm actually gonna buy my own copy. But again, I'm liking this enough that I immediately went and got the second, which is not super common for me. I've made more progress on In the Ravenous Dark by A.M. Strickland whenever like I was driving in my car and then when I did a few like chores around the house. Guys, I've made the decision I'm gonna DNF this at 290 pages in. Yeah, I'm like 75% done. And I just don't care. I don't care. This isn't Polly. No, the main character just happens to have romantic feelings for two separate people. And I'm not convinced that she has romantic feelings for these two people. I'm convinced she's horny and wants to sleep with both of them. One of which I really don't get because it's, like it's literally her guardian, the guy who is in charge of her, the one who, who's basically like her jailer. He can control her, he, he can force her to do things, he can force her to not do things. He can literally inflict pain just by touching her. She was taught from her father growing up not to trust these people. Having one of these ghosts tied to your soul is a terrible thing. And yet, like, that she has feelings for him and I'm just I'm so unconvinced by it. It's incredibly ridiculous. I really hate that. Anytime it is showcased, I am so uncomfortable. Then on the opposite side with the princess Lydia, I'm I'm a little more convinced by feelings there, but for the most part, I just think like these two want a bone. bone. That's that's about it. Some events that take place in the plot, the impact of them hinges on the fact Lydia and Rovin are in love, have very strong feelings for each other. And I'm just not convinced by that. So like th that element of the plot makes no sense to me. It's so ridiculous. They've known each other for like a week. And I realize the irony of me saying that in comparison to like A Strange and Stubborn Endurance where they haven't even known each other for a week. But I was convinced by the feelings in that book. I am not convinced by anything here. The plot itself is also so slow moving, like nothing has happened. Rovin has kind of investigated and followed in her in her father's footsteps of like trying to figure out 
what's going on in this world, in this country, what's causing blood mages to die young, and like what's causing this, they call it the blight, That's it's like this almost fog thing that's overtaking the world. And she's trying to figure out what's causing all of this, but I just don't care because the author introduced it and it it's taken so long for anything around that to be acknowledged. Rovin as a main character also is just very frustrating. She's not particularly likable, though even so, I do feel like I can root for her, but every time she takes a step forward, she also takes three steps back, and it's so irritating. Where I was right before DNFing, like we were gearing up towards something really crazy. I was getting so bogged down by these all long descriptions and the romance with her her guardian character that I actually had to stop listening to the audiobook and start skimming the book itself because I wanted to know what was going to happen next but I didn't care about all of the extra stuff then it hit the point where I f I could tell what was going to happen next and I, I did not want to read that I did not care to read that so officially gave up on this and DNF'd it I'm a little I'm a little salty I'm not gonna lie so yeah that's unfortunate. Oh, I forgot to show y'all. We got this adorable mushroom like cave thing for Sam and it is so stinking cute. He hasn't gotten in it yet. Um, I put his blanket in there to try and like make it smell a bit more like him, but it's just so cute. Josh and I couldn't resist. We had to grab it, but that's it for this week. I finished two books. I nearly finished a third. So not a terrible reading week overall, especially seeing as how this boy is chunky. Not the books I was planning to read for this reading vlog. Anyway, I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap this up here. So thank you so much for coming to my channel, y'all. I really appreciate it. Make sure to hit like and subscribe down below. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, leave me a night sky emoji in the comments. I have all my socials as well as a few ways you can support me linked in the description. I come out with videos on Monday and Friday, but until then, I hope you continue to have a terrific day. Love you, bye!